Hey everyone, welcome to Office Hours with Cloud Posse, your weekly dose of insider DevOps trends, AWS news, and Terraform insights, all sourced from our SweetOps community, plus a live Q&A you can't find anywhere else. It's May 22nd, 2024. I'm your host, Eric Osterman. Real quick, I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator for funded startups and enterprises that helps teams who are overwhelmed with AWS. We do this by using our over 200 Terraform modules that have been battle tested and downloaded over 100 million times. So no matter where you find yourself on this journey, we are here to help your team out. Just head over to cloudposse.com slash meet. Again, cloudposse.com slash meet, answer a few quick questions and we'll plot a roadmap to success for free. So how can you maximize today's session? First off, our format is informal, engage as much as you'd like, ask questions, and if you're curious about any of our open source tools or modules, go for it. For those on the recording, we host these calls live, so don't miss out. Join us live by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com slash office hours. So uh, with that said, let's jump into some announcements. Uh, first one is, I mean, this is like the definition of why competition is good. For years and years, people have been asking that HashiCorp introduce encrypted state or something compensating in that manner. And nothing has happened forever <laughs> until like this past week. And um, uh, apparently Mart, super active core contributor to the Terraform team, uh, who has also incidentally submitted his uh, provider uh, key to uh, Open Tofu. That's a separate matter. So apparently, Mart has uh, come back to this uh, two days ago and added some additional musings about how this might be implemented. And I kind of like uh, part of the suggestions here, uh, which would be if you abstract away what it is to be a secret uh, to an ID or a key, and you designate that to some secure key storage system, you can accomplish something quite similar. Um, kind of like if you're familiar with very good security, VGS or how you know, uh, Stripe uh, works, you know, for some sensitive piece of information, you are given back a token. And so long as you use that token everywhere, everything just works. And when you need to look up that value, you query the service. So in this case, if that was abstracted in the Terraform core, so it could somehow retrieve secrets from some place and use these token values, um, Terraform state wouldn't have those sensitive things in there. So this is not necessarily uh, talking about state encryption, but a way of securing secrets outside of Terraform state. I think there's a case to be made that both are good. I would rather not have the secrets in there at all. However, what we've seen by having the encrypted state by KMS key or some other key that you can control that prevents tampering of that state in the bucket. There are arguments uh, that he brings up here of why uh, you know they haven't really pursued this, and that you know if you have access to the deployment environment, you presumably could do any of these things anyways. Therefore, it's a moot point to be able to encrypt things. I don't really buy it. I get it, but security is always defense in depth. And there isn't going to be one thing that solves it all. It's having lots of different things that just make it very cumbersome to attack, in this case, the Terraform state. Matt, any thoughts on this one? Uh, a couple of things. So one, it's the proposal is I, I get like what, doing it this way, but it's also um, it makes some assumptions in that you do have an external right secret store that you can encrypt and store this in. And for many Terraform use cases, that is not the case, um, especially if like, you know, um, that's opinionated. Maybe it's pluggable in some other ways to do it, but if you're you're writing modules for like large scale consumption and configurations and everything else, maybe that's like not as easy to do this. Um, you know, from that perspective, I, I also think it's like 
it's somewhat making it someone else's problem, um, <laughs> you know, to, to, to do this. And you're, you're, you're saying like, we, we recognize that there are secrets that you may input, but don't forget that state may also include items that come back from the cloud resources or properties that come back from the cloud resources that you um, that that you're provisioning or updating or whatever that that are marked as um, sensitive and those things are still not encrypted. They're still stored in plain text in in state. So unless you actually encrypt the state, I don't know how that gets handled. Um, and then I just as I was looking at this right now on the screen, it just one of the things that popped into my head was <laughs> there. I don't believe there is anything legally in place that would prevent Terraform from just copying the Open <laughs> Tofu implementation and copying it into their code base. And then yeah, I don't know what I don't know then what happens to that code though if that becomes BSL licensed or if that particular piece of code is no longer BSL. Yeah. I don't know what happens there, but I was just thinking like because they reference right above this, they actually reference the open tofu issue. Uh, it popped into my head. I was like, well, why don't they just copy what what open tofu did? <laughs> so yeah, um, well, I, mean, I think that is viable, and MPL permits that. You just have to maintain the license files um, and yeah. uh, the license headers on everything to make it very clear. Um, yeah. And, Make sure it doesn't get contaminated. Right. So, and then I, they I, hope I, the I tofu can send them a cease and desist. <laughs> ah. Yeah. I had I had some boons on this. I hadn't been on in a few months because of a conflicting meeting I have, but got canceled today. Um I as you know, with I've mentioned before in calls months ago, we have a pretty pretty heavy compliance requirement and security requirements in my org. Um I absolutely want the secret stored somewhere else. Um, though I agree there should be a opinionated default, though I would still have that default be a separate file, but it, with some open source technology, I don't want the open tofu people making, like writing out all their own encryption code from scratch, because that's a lot to maintain. There's a lot of security things there and compliance things to deal with there. Um, a lot, it introduces more risk than using a well accepted um, security tool. Um, uh, but the big reason to have, but there's a few big reasons to keep the, secrets separate. Um, the biggest one being auditability. Um, if all you have as access to state, then you have no way of knowing when someone looked at that state, if they ac access that secret or not. Um, and there are a lot of compliance requirements that if a secret's been accessed and someone leaves the business or anything like, like that, you have to rotate all those credentials. Uh, while if it's stored in a KMS or some other secret store, then you have true auditability when that actual secret was accessed. Uh, the other one is, is I don't buy this thing of, oh, you can put everything on the internet and if it's encrypted, it's safe. Obviously you're not putting your state directly on the internet, but um, I think things that need to be very strictly controlled should also be strictly controlled by in other ways beyond just saying it's encrypted in this one place. So storing a separate system such as a KMS or secrets manager, or I'd say KMS, I mean SSM, with kit with game as secrets manager or vault or something like that has a lot of other benefits beyond that. Cause if someone can just copy this, the thing is if someone has the state file and they are like a bad actor, a bad employee and, and they, or someone hacking in and they get your state file and they get your key and they have all your state files, they can play with them at their will. You know, all they need is that one file, that one key. If it's in an API based system like vault or something else, they would have to go and fetch every single secret in existence out of there to get them. They couldn't walk away with, with the, you know, having the key is no, of no use unless you still have authentication access to that system. Um, so it, it's a, an extra measure that it, you know, has a lot of benefits to separate them. Just my opinions on the approaches we, we are taking. We, we have, for the most part, there's a few exceptions, got to the point that we just architect our infrastructure so we don't have any secrets landing, any true secrets. And by se true secrets, I mean passwords. In a federal sense, everything's a secret. <laughs> but <laughs> from, from a, but from a, even an IP and a host name is a secret, but um, from a, you know, traditional password, you know, credential type thing or, or keys, 
um, the uh, we with only a few exceptions, everything's out of state for this reason. Um, Are you doing uh, but, uh, active checks to ensure that doesn't happen as the code? No, I mean we're not we're not super thorough. It was just more of uh, we we are just been. I said it's not complete. There are a few exceptions that are difficult to manage. We're working on. Um, those are exceptions that where we are instead of even we were basically eliminating the secrets altogether. You know, you like you like you have RDS passwords. Well, you should just move to RDS IM off so you don't need passwords. You know, as mm -hmm. an example. Um, so largely, we've been eliminating credentials. Um, in other cases, we're just taking a different pattern to pushing those. Same thing. We don't have we don't have our toolings. You know, tooling like our um, CD tooling, whether it's Spinnaker, Argo, whatever. We don't have it managed secrets. We keep it out of bound from that. Um, we only have it managed the actual configs. So we're because of compliance, security, other audibility, other requirements, we're keeping them distinctly separate uh, for that reason. Do we have good yeah. controls on that? Uh, no, uh, we just have good good SREs that are watching it close right now. We're we're working ourselves. That's actually a topic I would like to hear about in another call. Is is what. What people are doing around Git policies around in their code to sort of enforce these things. It's another topic. I'd love to okay. hear. Yeah, I'm just a bit like confused. How do you how do you provision how do you provision RDS without like specify with Terraform without actually specifying like the root password or like Datadog or like ops genie or any of those things where you have to well, specify Datadog you can do you can, you can Datadog you can do because the Datadog providers uh support taking the API keys out externally like an API that's uh, true from, from the from the environment but not yeah, so you have to have a wrapper of some yeah. sort to then provide that which is annoying um but it was our choice to do that instead of having polluting our state files once yeah, this but even stuff when... is out there in a bit RDS is more difficult that's what where we're we're switching to other methods um so i don't want to <laughs> reveal everything we have where we sell passwords but um but uh rds yeah rds is more difficult you have to do some manual steps if you want to eliminate, eliminate that which is a pain um yeah and, and what's even crazier is a lot of these solutions that even allow you to pass something in via the environment um those values if they're used in the provider in in any of the data sources or anything or the resource that gets provisioned, it still actually gets stored in state, even though in some cases, yeah, you have to be careful. Like if, if you think, yeah. oh, I'm gonna store my secret <laughs> in SSM, the SSM provider ends up storing the secret in your state anyway. So yeah, it's like exactly that defeats the point <laughs> of this whole operation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some don't do that. I forgot if the KMS provider does that or not. Um, yeah. but um yeah, they're it, it's difficult to go that path, I and mean, that's that's our goal. Unless unless we we're still on the boat uh, on the fence between HashiCorp and OpenTofu. Personally, I would go OpenTofu, but that's because I'm a opinionated about it. But um, we're we've not you know migrated to that yet. Um, but if it becomes available, encryption is you know encryption state thing be outsourced to an oh. external provider like a KMS or something, yeah. then we will absolutely adopt that and not worry about this problem. Um, and it, for those dealing with compliance, that if you can export, if you can, you know, outsource to either GCP or uh, Amazon or whoever's provider, um, so Secrets Manager uses KMS, so on, the story gets a whole lot easier for compliance because you can say, okay, are you using an HSM? Are you using FIPS? Blah blah blah. They have that already. Um, I I, I just want to be very clear here, like Open Tofu one point seven released end-to-end -end state encryption that includes like using a KMS system like AWS KMS or GCP yep. or OpenBow or any of those kind of things. So um that that's that has been released. That's one regular we're, we're eyeing it for that reason. We're eyeing it for that reason, especially. Yeah. It's a huge use case. Aaron, uh you raise your hand. Pardon me. Yeah. Um is the idea behind the state encryption um, methods that if you're going to operate the Terraform on your laptop, somehow you have to get the key to your laptop? There's some sort of tool that will retrieve it or you keep it in a secure encrypted file? Well, what Matt was describing when it's when it's the model where you're using a provider like uh, Secrets Manager or something, mm -hmm. uh, the provider will then go make that call for you. So you're authenticated to Amazon and then the provider will call out. So other tools like SOPs have similar 
XOPS can call out to GPG or to KMS or to Vault. So the provider then handles that for you. It says this thing is located over here in this other system, which you have to separately be authenticated to. So what's interesting about this is you can have an S3 bucket that has lots of different state in there. Everyone can read it, I mean, access it, but it's encrypted, so to say. So with unless you have the KMS key, you can't decrypt some portion of the state in the S3 bucket because portions of your state can be encrypted with different KMS keys. Which was another use case we had and that we wanted, and I don't know if it'll work out with OpenTooth, but we can do what we want for this. We wanted our developer teams to be able to see standard configs, you know, like what's the host name? What's the, I don't know, what's what's the, what version of RDS is set? You know, the general infrastructure configs, but we didn't want them to see secrets. Um, so we couldn't give them access to state at all for that reason. So instead we had to make a separate file that we have a, we have a automation for that generates Terraform output cache. So they have a place to see the Terraform. We put everything that we want them to see in the outputs and we made a cache file that probably is a cache of those outputs because we can't give them access to the state because it has secrets. You'll so, like our new KV storage modules that we're introducing. Okay, I'll have to look into that. Um, but <laughs> having uh, having a readable state with encrypt things encrypted inside the state is a potential way for people to actually go, assuming OpenTofu will let you still do like Terraform output on that state uh, without outputting the sensitive stuff, which would be useful. Um, that you have a way of giving access to people without giving them. Yeah, you know, although the whoever runs Terraform needs to be able to decrypt state because the actual state file itself is encrypted. So yeah. if you can't decrypt it, then you can't run output. Okay. Yeah. Aaron? Yeah, um, Sean, did you mention a, a AWS Secrets Manager provider? I haven't seen that. Is that a thing? No, I, I haven't used the open tofu. I'm, I'm saying how these systems normally work. So Matt will know more on this. What I'm saying is there's other tools that have done this historically. What Matt described is what how I think open tofu is doing it. But like with tools like SOP, okay, with tools like SOPS, if you go look at SOPS, mm -hmm. uh, which is a secrets tool, uh, SOPS doesn't have its own encryption system. If you choose, I'm going to use GPG, or it's not GPG, it's, it's a wrapper around GPG. Or I'm going to use okay, uh, hey, I'm going to use Secrets Manager. Or I'm going to use SSM. Or I'm going to use GCPs and Vault. There's a few others it supports, I think. Yeah. Um, and that's built into that. So I'm assuming the open yeah. will speak to that, I guess. Yep. Yeah. In Open Tofu, there's things called key providers, and you you basically when you in your Terraform block you set encryption, and then you set what the key provider is. So that's um, you know, Amazon KWS or GCP KWS or um, OpenBow or um, they have another one other standard. Uh, what I think an AES algorithm or something that you can use with your own passphrase and salt and all of that kind of thing that you specify locally. Um, where, but the idea is that OpenTofu isn't actually doing the encryption itself; it's delegating the encryption to to another service and it's saying like here encrypt encrypt this piece of data with your you know with your algorithms give me back the encrypted value and then the encrypted value is actually what's stored in the in the state bucket um, and then when you retrieve that in order to decrypt it the user running terraform also needs to have access to be able to run decrypt on you know using that key um, as well. So if that user doesn't have rights to do that, you get access denied and you don't, you, you can't run Terraform or read the state or, you know, anything else. So even if somebody stole all your state files and all your keys and whatnot, if, if you, let's say you use Secrets Manager, it just says, or Vault as a backend, if they no longer had access to Secrets Manager or Vault, they wouldn't be able to decrypt it. They have to have active access to that. Uh, rather than if they just stole the files and they could do something with it. Um, so it's a much better security thing. And you have the auditability. Every time someone goes and tries to read that secret, you have an audit log in the system. And finally, again, I, this is a huge one for us, is the compliance aspect. If I tell an auditor, hey, we're using KMS, but you're using uh, OpenTofu. Yeah, but OpenTofu is not, is, is not the crypto provider Amazon is. Um, then it makes the audits, the you know compliance story a whole lot easier because they they have that back with HSMs and a bunch of other compliance requirements. Yeah. 
All right, well, let's pause there uh, so we can get through some other items um, on the list. Also, I do want to try and get to some questions. Um, Enrique, I, I see you join, and Oliver, I think you have some questions as well. So uh, let me see how we'll uh, we'll get through these next ones probably pretty quickly. Uh, famous last words, and then get to your questions. All right, uh, next one was something I forget where it where I saw it. Um, a common complaint for developers uh, when they get into DevOps uh, areas is when they start seeing all the bash scripts everywhere. And uh, you know, there's no strong typing and so forth. So uh, there's been a lot of DSLs over the years that improve the experience on bash. This is a different approach. This is more one where it's like TypeScript, which compiles down to bash and then runs with type safety. Uh, I haven't tried it out myself, but looks interesting uh, if you're willing to do that transpiling to bash. And also be interesting, I, I don't know the answer, but if you can go the other way, like actually take a bash script and run this and get mm -hmm. the type safe version so you can iterate on it, or do you have to like rewrite every script? Yeah, probably the latter. I mean, if you look at this, it looks like your typical, you know, transpile machine generated bash code. Kind of nice from an obfuscation perspective, <laughs> but you also see what a pain in the butt it is to do uh, proper bash uh, like type. I love bash. I I love shell scripts, I've written tons of it. But whenever you're getting into complex logic, that's when you should be switching to a Python or something anyway. Yeah. 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 I mean, doing exactly. thing, like, stick with bash but the second you start doing like data manipulation and you have to pipe 10 times then it's time yeah. to switch to python yeah but, although <laughs> make now how do i get a how do i get a working python environment on my machine that's the next question <laughs> oh you need a bash <laughs> so, script right exactly so it's I mean, it's you know it's hard when you if you control the environment it's a lot easier than if you're trying to do it for wide you know, wide distribution. So why? Yeah, I, I mean that, that. Yeah, when you have like the bootstrap tools and the omnibuses or whatnot, then yeah, you end up having to write Bash to distribute something. I know I've had to write yeah. a lot of it. Yeah. So therefore, I don't see this tool being that valuable when you control the environment or you know the tool chain and the language and you know like in your company's uh, walled garden, you can pretty much choose whatever you want. Where it gets interesting is where you're trying to write like an installer script that's going to be portable across you know multiple versions perhaps of a bash and so forth. Uh, trying to do that consistent, reliably with a team who isn't well versed in all the nuances and compatibility issues in bash and type safety, then that gets difficult. So I can see this as being a great way to write better portable bash scripts when you're when that's when you can't control. The platform you're installing on and that's why you use bash right because it's everywhere you don't have to install a bunch of stuff yeah i i found uh chat gpt to be awesome at bash <laughs> i mean I've, I've been writing bash for 20 years and so i'm you know but still it's not a it's not a programming language that i yeah i much prefer python you know uh for obvious reasons but uh, i find that, myself sometimes I just give it the bat to chat GPD and I say, okay, write me something that'll do this, this, and this, and this and batch. Then I have to debug it a little bit and bang, I'm done. Yeah. Let me, let me just say, I find myself uh, it, particularly in very complex bash scripts, correcting chat GPT hallucinations all the time. Um, you know, I'm like, wait, that isn't how that be, that command behaves. And then it will be like, oh yes, you are correct. I realize that now that it does not, and then it gives me another version of it. So be careful. Yeah, yeah, be careful yeah, what sure. you're getting oh. out of there. Oh no, absolutely. I I I don't think I remember an instance where I could just take it wholesale and just plunk it, and it would run with you know, except in very simple situations. But the thing is that it takes out the all the nitty gritty, right? Typically, you can fairly easily tell. You know, maybe it's a regular expression. You look at it and you can tell, oh, no, that doesn't do exactly what ChatGPT thinks it's actually uh, doing. And but so it, it, it cuts your, the amount of uh, uh, work uh, that you have to do by a factor of 10. And, and it tends to be really like it, it not non obfuscated bash. Like it tends to be fairly vanilla, you know, and if it and if it uses features sometimes that uh, like 
I don't like a raise and bash. They, they annoy me. So, you know, when ChatGPT gives me something with a raise, I, I tell it, well, you know, write this, rewrite this code without using a raise and it'll do it. Then it'll, you know, quite often it simplifies things. All right. Well, let's transition into some of the questions we've got. Um, I, there were a bunch of other announcements, but I don't think any of that important. And we're, there's no way we'd be getting to uh, questions here if we uh, continued with the announcement. So we'll get back to those if we have time. Um, first question I wanted to uh, answer was from Enrique. Uh, Enrique was asking in Slack uh, something, uh, which I thought was interesting because it's not something I've, it's not pushback we've received before. So I'm open to, you know, uh, other <laughs> perspective. All right, let me bring it up here. So let's see the, I don't see, uh, there was a, there was a longer thread. This is a repost of the message. Yeah, the, the threads, the thread is in the GitHub actions channel. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was basically, well, let's go back here. I don't remember uh, the details here. So question was oh right so uh, you were busy making a github action workflow that's going to execute some playwright tests uh and then realize that well those tests aren't going to work because the endpoints are private inside of a vpc so your challenge is then how do you make uh this then maybe call a workflow uh dispatch from in your case i think you were looking at it from the code pipeline perspective um and this is where I said, this is where it's it's an important consideration here. Sometimes uh, when answering questions is this thing called the X, Y problem. Uh, you're looking at how to solve this in a particular way, but let's see if that's even the way we should be solving it. So we have this problem. I mean, we've had this problem and we solved it all the time. So running GitHub Actions, maybe doing Terraform. If you're using a database provider like Postgres provider and you need to manage things on the database, how do you do that? Your database is in a private VPC. Or if you're deploying things to Kubernetes without Argo CD, how do you connect to the Kubernetes APIs? Or in this case, doing playwright tests against some internal apps, you have the same problem. And the way it's been solved, it used to never be a problem because you had Jenkins running inside your VPC before. Now you're starting to use more cloud resources. So let's say, you know, uh, GitHub. So how do you give GitHub access? Well, the, it's a solved problem in my perspective, and it's the primary reason why self-hosted runners are made available. So you deploy the self-hosted runners inside of your VPC, and then the, they can connect to it. Now, we do something slightly different we have typically an automation account with inside of our reference architecture where we have a Kubernetes cluster. That's where we run uh, ARC, the actions runner controller. Then we have a transit gateway inside of our organization that connects specific VPCs together to the hub. And then we can transit that gateway to deploy or test things in those environments. How you implement it will depend on like your, your own uh, maturity and where you're at and other considerations. But um, I don't consider it an insecure thing for a few reasons. One is GitHub never has any hard-coded AWS credentials like when we do things because we're using GitHub OIDC. So we're basically provisioning IAM roles that uh, enable uh, the actions running in specific repositories um, to do things with AWS APIs, if we need that. For playwright tests, you probably don't need that. Either. Then um, you can have other controls in place. Uh, so for example, um, well, before I continue, what were some of the specific concerns that were brought up by the security people that said they, they don't like the idea of giving GitHub access to anything inside of your VPC? Oh, well, indeed, that, that was a pretty long conversation that I had with the security team. <laughs> okay. And they, they basically, um, I mean, there is not a specific uh, concern that I that they have. I mean, there is more like a philosophy that they want to follow. Uh, I mean, they, they want to try to split um, all, all of the resources that are being created in AWS only by a repo that contains all of the references to those uh, artifacts. I mean, let's say uh, that's something that I just learned when I was launching these questions. Yeah. 
but uh, the the thing that I use in counter is that the company is is not using Terraform, it's not using GitHub Actions to create any kind of resources. I mean, they, they don't want to control the resources in AWS by any any third party. I mean, they they just want to have full control of the resources, having an a specific an, an specific repo that contains templates files and config files that can be digested and converted into cloud formation artifacts. So that's the way they have a full control of the resources in AWS using this repo that contains all the templates, configuration files that will be converted into cloud formation artifacts and that the cloud formation will be in charge of creating, creating the infrastructure. So that way all of the infra all of the infra that is needed needs to be sent through a uh, a new PR into that repo. So all of the infra, I mean, owners can check their, can check your PR, can check your commit and needs to verify if the resources that you are creating doesn't create conflicts with other resources. So yeah. all of the infra, it is being documented in a specific repo. So that's basically the philosophy that they want to follow. So sure. that way, that is not that is not though to be clear that is not mutually exclusive from what we're doing here. Uh, we practice exactly that. It's called GitOps. It's operations by pull request. Uh, yeah. Well, pull request is one implementation of it. It doesn't have to be pull request, and it's it's something very similar to what's being done frequently, like in the Kubernetes and Argo CD or Flux world, where you have a repository that represents your desired state. Sometimes it's called a, a immutability firewall. Basically, the only way to mutate something is you got to make the mutation in the version control. And then yep. something else is responsible for executing that and doing it. So in their case, there I guess something is something somewhere. Are you using GitHub or are you using another version control system? Uh, yeah, only GitHub, yeah. Okay, so you have GitHub, something there is triggering a webhook or something is polling GitHub inside of AWS that is translating that to CloudFormation templates by, by taking the, the templates and the config and doing that and then submitting that to CloudFormation and deploying that. That is like Argo CD looking at a GitHub repository for Kubernetes manifests and when they change, reconciling those and synchronizing those with the Kubernetes cluster. We're just saying, we're saying the same thing, but some process somewhere needs to execute that. They So that has to be running in AWS is my assumption, or where are they running that process? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it is there. Yeah. So, so, okay, so they, they're running a process, we're running a process. Their process is run maybe with Amazon code build or code pipeline or things like that. We're saying our process is run by an agent uh, with uh, uh, it call, it called a GitHub action uh, runner agent. And that is talking to GitHub, just like their code is talking to GitHub. So still I see total symmetry here. I, um, but Matt, any thoughts on this one? No, I mean, I don't want to sound um, snip, but or you know whatever uh, flippant on this one, but like uh, you know, security teams often throw up blockers for things they don't understand or don't quite grok like all the way through. Um, so someone probably just needs to explain it like in you know in a diagram that compares like current solution to desired yeah. solution and show how they're exactly the same or let them tell you where they're not or where they're concerned and then, um, you know, work from there. You know, unfortunately, it's often proving your case to a security team rather than, you know, you're you're uh, presumed guilty rather than innocent <laughs> until you can <laughs> you can say, like, here's why it's safe to do what I want to do, you know, that kind of thing. And and I assume a lot of things, right? Uh, you're, you're not running in a single Amazon account. Your dev is totally separate from staging, is totally separate from production, is totally separate from your security, is totally separate from other things, right? And your playwright tests are never running in a VPC that it could do anything nefarious or bad. They're running in a dev uh, account in a separate VPC doing things there. So you have still isolation. One of the things that frustrates me, uh, sometimes working 
uh, you know, around security concerns like this is, you know, says who, and you know, they they you, you got to walk back that requirement to who actually came up with it and understand what their concerns were, and then if you aren't maybe depending on where you are in the company, uh, it can be harder to make your case. Also, you know, if you're newer in a company, if, you know, seniority is a factor, if tenure is a factor, how long people have been there, uh, making a case can become harder and harder. My point is this is done all over the place and it's not an anti-pattern. It is still GitOps. It is still operations by pull request. There's something else there. That yeah, you know. I mean, they, they provide an example that I mean, as a I mean, for me to understand the the concern. I mean, they they say that okay, what if you have like this connection between the actions and and your EC two that is going to be used by GitHub Actions, and let's suppose that GitHub Actions is using a Docker image that injects a lot of libraries or a lot of things that I mean it are out of our control. I mean. What happens if the, because I mean, GitHub Actions uh, is the one that will control that EC2. Is the one that, will, that is going to control what mm -hmm. is being executed. You, you, no, you you control like what's on there though. Yeah. Like the image that it runs and the AMI that it runs and all of those things is yours, like in your, in your EC, like in your actual AWS account. Yeah, but I mean, they just try to explain me that, I mean, let's suppose that I'm using an image that is being built by something else, by someone else. I mean, if, the, if that image have a, yeah, let's say a, a break in, in their security. So they just, they are they are like in this position that I, I don't want to lose the control of what is being used in our internal, what is being used in our internal infrastructure. I got you. So, so yeah. it's like, okay, I mean, I mean, I, I, just, I kind of yeah. seem to understand their point, but I mean, I see. My, 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 my specific use case doesn't require any Docker uh, image. It doesn't require any other external library. I mean, my use case is pretty simple. If I'm just executing one repo that is internal and just executing against an internal endpoint. I mean, it is pretty simple to what I'm trying to do, but they are like, okay, I don't want to give an exception to you because if they give an exception to you, it's like all the teams are going to follow the same approach that, that you are following and it will, and it will it will become like a... Yeah, no, I get it. it I mean, the supply chain attacks and, and those kinds of things are a big concern. And it sounds like maybe you have a pretty... Uh, walled off environment right now, and you're not leveraging a lot of these things we take for granted. Um, being able to run, you know, arbitrary GitHub actions and so forth. Um, so it sounds like, yeah, there's a deeper hurdle here. This is not an easy solution for you to implement given all the other constraints you have. Anyway, oh, yeah. although and and the second thing, I just sorry, I, the second thing that I just want to say is, I mean, I'm actually following the same and the same scenario that you you mentioned. Yeah, you just mentioned that. Since I'm just joined the company one month ago, one one and a half month ago, so I'm. It's like you cannot propose ideas, or uh, you, you follow can. our process. Yeah. <laughs> and that makes sense, yeah. right? You got to first seek to understand before you can seek to change, and you always yeah. uh, face an uphill battle until people feel heard or understood there's probably you know there's there's obviously good reasons why they do things the way they do uh but they're alternative consideration invite them to office hours sometime <laughs> yeah. although uh no i was just gonna say you know they're they have all this concern and everything else but inherently they have no problem running playwright tests which are which in you know in install a chain of like thousands of packages from the NPM registry that are all out of their control and could be doing something nefarious that you don't know, like, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to put, like, you have to put guards in place to make sure that the things that you allow it to do are only the things that you allow it to do. Um, you know, it's, I don't know. I think it's, I guess I get it, but it's just it's frustrating sometimes of uh, a lot, when a lot the of things it. that some people some people are concerned about like so much, but then they ignore something else that is just as big of a risk or maybe even a bigger risk. But anyway, I'll let uh, I'll let us move on to the next topic. All right, let's uh, see here. Did I uh, do we still have Oliver here? I know he was on early, or 
that was a I mean, maybe it was a different uh no it was omar omar uh that i was thinking of i don't know if omar was able to join but he did bring this up again uh, i'm not sure if he's able to join he was still curious about it so for helm templating which tools are you using these days uh still helm file um he's tried helmsman which was a similar tool to helms helm file but i think it was in python or something um, he's used Argo CD before, but in this case, cannot use Argo CD, I assume he means, and he needs something more CLI driven like help. Uh, so yeah, what, what is the current state? Are there uh, new new kids on the block uh, other than Helm file? There's customize, obviously, that's quite popular. It takes a different approach. Yeah. Native into the kubectl um, the CLI. I would probably, before I started with Helm File, take a look again at kubectl and see if that resonates with you more. Cu uh, customize, you mean? Yeah. What did I say? <laughs> kubectl. Oh, no. Oh, customize is built into kubectl, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, no. You said you would take a look at kubectl. Oh, oh yeah, 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 Take yeah, a look yeah. at customize. Customize. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for cleaning that up. Yeah, take a look at customize. See if it'll work uh, for your use case. Um, we are still predominantly using Helm file, uh, maybe for other reasons. Um, I think it depends a little bit on, you know, how much are you still relying on Helm versus raw manifests? And customize is a raw manifest approach more. And what's interesting with Helm file is Helm file adds the ability to so to say monkey patch using customize. So you get kind of this Swiss army knife of being able to do everything you want with one tool, but yeah, is it always elegant? Maybe not. At least it's all declarative within the Helm file configuration and Helm file is very you know well-documented and lots of examples out there, but I'm curious, anybody else using a tool like Helm file or something else? Not Flux, not Argo CD, not like the operator approach, but something CLI driven. If I, I would just add, if I were starting today on a project and I had a choice of doing it, I would definitely go the customized route. Sorry, yeah. they, they say that why well, they couldn't use Argo? Well, I mean, I, that, you know... <laughs> A lot of people like to say Argo is really easy. You know, it's even an add-on with EKS. And I have a very different opinion. Just like running a Redis database or Postgres database or MongoDB or Kafka, it's just a chart, just install it, just, you know, run it. It's done, five minutes, dude, I'm, you know, I'm a you know, DevOps legend except for when it comes to all the other aspects of operationalizing, backups, restoring, uh, monitoring and durability and things like that. Integrating it with your authentication system, exposing it to the DNS, getting access to it to begin with. Yeah, I guess I guess the question is, what is the requirement? Because yeah. any, any server you're going to have, whether it be Flux, Flux is a bit easier, but or Argo, you're going to have the same requirements, right? Or right. they look for something like Helm File. But he specifically it, asked for CLI. Yeah. Oh, okay. So if he's asking for a, a one-off yeah. command, yeah, that's different. Argo is a totally different beast. He's he's looking for not Helm, not customize. If there's something something else, got you. And and that was just me empathizing with times were easier before there were tools like Flux and, and Argo CD. Like they solve a lot of things. They're very elegant, but I I really don't like the characterization that they're easy to do right. Um, as we're probably yeah. going through our seventh implementation of how to do Argo CD. And we still feel like we haven't totally nailed it. And there are things that we would like to improve. Uh, I think I think the biggest thing for me with, with Argo is that they they don't yet have the, the manager of managers nailed. <laughs> like to deploy Argo clusters when you have like, a, you have multiple Kubernetes clusters like spread all over the place to have, you know, multiple then you end up having multiple Argo clusters or either that or you compromise security, one or the other, or multiple Argo installations, um, or you compromise security. Those are the two trade-offs. And then if you end up with multiple Argo installations everywhere, how do you monitor, view, log into, you know, get around into the multiple 
Argo, um, you know, cl uh, installations without um, w without needing to maintain like you know a whole basically. crazy way to do it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, it had, it's it just it's not easy. So much time <laughs> automating it end to end from the GitHub repositories to the permissions. To the, to the webhook notifications, to using uh, desired state repositories or deployment repositories um, and getting it to work with Helm and Helm file and all these different systems um, in a repeatable manner has not been as, uh, I, I don't wanna sugarcoat it. <laughs> all right, uh, let's see, next uh, question. Uh, Vinkat, are you on today? I haven't seen him today. Uh, he's almost always here. He had a question uh, last week about uh, ECR pull times. But he, since he's always on, we'll just ask that next time. And Matt Galley, are you here? I had a question, I think, from something I'd seen you done. And I thought he was here earlier, but not anymore. Oh, well. I don't know. I didn't see him. OK, I'll ask my question next week then. So let's jump back to announcements. we got 10 more minutes or so. Um, a lot of these are quick. So speaking of Argo CD, um, there's a mysterious uh, critical security update. And I say mysterious because I can't find a CVE on it. And the release notes say nothing about this being a security update. And uh, the, the closest I've come is seeing somebody who was looking at the uh, pull requests identifying something to do with Redis authentication. And so maybe something related to Redis and Argo CD, uh, but I don't know. Anybody know more about what the security issue with Argo CD is? Maybe it's to stop using licensed Redis and they just mislabeled it as a security thing. <laughs> Everyone, every every pull request I've seen to do with Redis lately has to do with the Redis licensing change. I, that's the only reason I expect really that that might be it. <laughs> okay, interesting. I didn't think about it that way. That makes sense. That that, well, that release only has a, a few things in its, in its change log, so it's not going to be much. Another exciting thing is uh, EKS has added native support for Core DNS auto scaling. This has bit our customers before, and by default, I think uh, EKS only deploys a single Core DNS or something, uh, unless you um, uh, customize the configuration. So if you have a busy cluster and lots of pods, core DNS gets overwhelmed, and then suddenly, mysteriously, DNS just stops working and you can't access any. So they or work. a node fails. Yeah, yeah, or the or exactly or that yeah. node that core DNS that pod was running on gets you know uh, consolidated maybe with Carpenter. Now your whole cluster loses network connectivity or DNS uh, resolution until the pod comes back online on another node. That's not a production cluster. Uh, so we've solved this in our implementations, but uh, looks like this is now gonna be solved in EKS. And it's pretty surprising for as long as EKS has been around, not this. I All checked right. the Argo thing for you for Redis. It's just that the Red the default Redis installation, if you use their like their out of the box one, didn't have authentication enabled. Okay. So it's a security issue, but it's not like they had a vulnerability. So basically, if some pod could connect to that Redis, they could uh, affect logins, maybe. And it's probably in the docs that you should enable an authentication. So this thing, it's like the Mongo years where people said Mongo got hacked, and it's just that Mongo didn't have a password. So people blamed Mongo when you're supposed to set uh, a password. It's just bad uh, default instructions. That's my understanding of it. Okay. Um, DigitalOcean uh, submits their provider key to open Tofu. That's exciting, just showing traction. Um, let me go back to my proposal. Um, some college kids did what college kids should do. They got suspicious or curious about how they're uh, connected uh, laundry machines worked in the dorm rooms and realized, yep, just like so many of these systems, there was like no authentication. And they were able to just see how the requests were coming from uh, their mobile device. They, uh, you know, probably with a man in the middle type of proxy or something. And then they were able to replay those. And yep, they loaded up their account with millions of dollars worth of free laundry. Uh, 
Uh, and to this day, it still hasn't been fixed and they still haven't been able to get a hold of anyone at the company to acknowledge the problem. But the company did take back their millions of dollars of laundry. Well, they can they can choose to ignore it at uh, six euros a, a load or whatever it said there on the front of that. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty expensive <laughs> that's for really, a load of laundry. <laughs> that's really expensive. Wow. Is that what it costs these days? Crazy. Uh, Atlantis, you know, it's been around the block for a long time. I'd like to say that Atlantis invented GitOps for Terraform back in the day. Uh, the project has a you know, new life as of a couple of years ago, and a lot of um, interest and improvements have been made. Uh, now they have a new website. So that's cool. I'm curious to see what the status is of their... Uh, CNCF application. I haven't checked on that lately. I thought that it was interesting that they they got a car vote uh, from from HashiCorp on uh, on the uh, running Terraform. Did they get an explicit carve out? Yeah, that's what I heard. Hmm. I'd like to, if you can find that, I, I'd be curious. Yeah. Yeah, let me see if I can find it where I saw it. Let's see. Um, ah, yes, I love to make fun of uh, GitHub on this one. I love GitHub. I love GitHub Actions. Um, unfortunately, half the GitHub Actions ecosystem is on Node 16 and seemingly not upgrading. And they were going to just kill Node 16 on June 30th. And I think they just had an oh shit moment where they realized half their GitHub Actions would stop working. So they're no longer killing off Node 16 on uh, June 30th. You can still uh, enable this environment variable, presumably at an organization level or repository level and continue running your insecure Node 16 GitHub Actions. And we are really frustrated at Cloud Posse. Uh, you know, we we started, you know, we do a lot of Terraform, we, we write, almost all of our own Terraform modules for the most part. Uh, and that has been a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because we haven't had any issues like this because we are a full control of our ecosystem and can update it and ensure it's working. But when it came to GitHub Actions, we decided, nah, let's not reinvent the wheel this time. Let's try and use third party actions as much as we can so we don't have to maintain all of it. And this has become the bane of our GitHub action existence is trying to get our actions to not have warnings about using node 16 because the upstream dependencies haven't been updated. It seems like a lot of GitHub actions are weekend projects uh, or, you know, quickly fall to the waste uh, or fall to the side and uh, get abandoned or people move on to other projects or Maybe they're no longer used, but there is so much technical debt associated with GitHub Actions. End of rant. Okay, got that, got that. Last one was a nice little write-up by N0 on kind of TerraTest versus the built-in native testing functionality of Terraform. A lot of medium posts and so forth have been written on the topic. What I liked about this is that it gave uh, you know more thorough examples of what a corresponding terror test would look like. Um, I wasn't entirely sure if it was fair and balanced. I mean, the the key thing here is that you know for the basic stuff, native tests are just so much easier to do. Uh, well, that was not an example of it. Um, Native tests are just so much easier to express, especially to non-Go programmers. They're a lot more terse. Uh, to, to do the same thing in native terror test uh, requires a lot more. But it's really only for very basic testing and not really integration testing. And that's where it kind of lost me on the article uh, that they were trying to say you could use it for integration tests. And I I, I didn't quite get that. But I, I admit I didn't thoroughly uh, read it. So you're you're saying which one of the two is um, better for integration testing, in your opinion? 
integration test. I mean, hands down, I think terror test is because you have whole terror test. Okay. all the libraries and you can actually test that something is fully functioning afterwards without lim being restricted to the very narrow scope of uh, what you can do in HCI. Right, right. HCL basically lets you do basic things like did this did did I get when I enabled this feature flag was this output set to what I expected to be set to, and that's pretty limiting. An example that I like to bring up um, in um, we had so much trouble managing our EKS modules uh, in the earlier days prior to having robust tests because some small change would break it so that the nodes would not join the cluster. The cluster came up just fine. The outputs would be just fine. The nodes come up just fine. The outputs are just fine. Are the nodes talking to the master? They are not. Could we launch a pod? We could not. That is why you need the proper integration testing, for example, for like an EKS cluster. Okay, we made it. We answered a bunch of questions. Uh, we got through the announcements. Hope you enjoyed those. It is time to wrap things up for office hours this week. Uh, please go to youtube.com slash cloud to subscribe. We have all our back catalog of office hours episodes there. If you found this session interesting and something you want to share with your team, that's the place to go. Check the show notes or the description. There will be um, chapters for every section so you don't have to listen to the whole thing to figure out where we talk about something. If you're interested to see if Cloud Posse can help you out at your business, please go to cloudposse.com slash meet, book a session with me directly. We'll talk through your situation and see if Cloud Posse can help you out. And for everything else, here you go. Sign up to our newsletter, newsletter.cloudposse.com. Um, we have our podcast, which is a syndication of our office hours. Go to podcast.cloudposse.com. Listen to it uh, on every major platform. And that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks all. See you all next week. Same time, same place. Oh, don't forget to register. Go to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com office hours. See you next week. Take care.